so uh, my name is Steve. I've been married for eight years uh, in May, and we have a three-year-old. Uh, he acts like he's 13 sometimes. Uh, so uh, be praying for me because I question his salvation sometimes. Sometimes he's a good child. Sometimes, Lord have mercy. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's exciting for me to be with you guys uh, this morning. So let's jump right in. I'm not going to take longer than three hours this morning. So let's just, I'm just kidding. Let's, uh, it's just going to be for a few minutes. Uh, but if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you're taking notes, the title of this morning's message is, Who Do You Think You Are? Who do you think you are? And as you can already tell by now, I'm a pretty energetic speaker, communicator. And so if you're too quiet, it kind of makes me nervous and I'll just start rambling longer. So if you want to get out here quickly, talk back to me a little bit sooner and just say, amen, preacher, brown boy, whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Okay. And uh, we'll be out of here and we'll beat the Baptist to lunch. All right. All right. All right. So here we go. Did you know that the average person thinks about 50,000 thoughts a day? 50,000 thoughts a day. That means as soon as you get up, there's thoughts always rambling in your mind, whether you want to pick up the phone, look at notification, or if you want to press the snooze button a couple of times. I, I'm really bad at my um, alarm because I know exactly how long the iPhone will give you a snooze before the next alarm goes. It's nine minutes. So I like in my mind, I'm doing math and I'm like, okay, I have like three extra snoozes. If I could just snooze three times, eh, excuse me. So you're making c consistent choices. You're making decisions. There's thoughts running through your mind. Is this outfit matching with these shoes or, you know, um, is my kid alive today? Um, are they eating well? All these thoughts are rambling in your mind, but I want to focus more importantly on the thoughts that you think about yourself. Because a lot of times I think the greatest critic of ourselves is us. If we look in the mirror, that's our greatest enemy a lot of times, right? We, we see all of our flaws. We see all of our mistakes. We see the things that maybe our dreams that we once had, but yet it had hasn't come to pass and we're like man if I would have done this or that or maybe when we look in the mirror we're comparing ourselves with someone else that looks more successful and we're trying to do everything to keep up with the Joneses but we realize that the Joneses financed a couple of months refinanced a couple of months ago and we're like okay now what do I do and we're trying to keep track and trying to say okay how can I juggle everything going on in life but more importantly I feel like if we are not careful the greatest battlefield that the enemy will play is within your mind. And so we have to understand, number one, how the enemy attacks us. And number two, we have to recognize the attacks of the enemy. And number three, we have to learn how to fight against the enemy. And I want you to know that the mind is a very powerful thing. And as we go through this message, you'll realize how powerful the mind is. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. I want you to underline, highlight, do whatever you want to emphasize that one part. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A lot of times... I get asked this question, Steve, I don't know what God's will is for my life. A lot of, a lot of times I have um, conversations with people that are in college, and the average college uh, student changes their majors about five times while they're in their college career. And so they're wondering, okay, Steve, I had um, plans to major in this, but as soon as I went to my first class in this major, I was like, nope, that's not for me. Um, I originally wanted to become a pharmacist for whatever reason. No offense to pharmacy. Uh, you, all, you guys are brilliant. Um, I went to my first uh, organic chemistry class, and I thought they were speaking in tongues. I, was, I, I did not understand a word that they were saying. And I was like, peace out, farm. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to be in this. And so a lot of times, 
you know, college students, I was just having a conversation with a young adult last night um, at, at a church service, and, and I told him, I said, I feel like uh, God's going to bring you into a season of clarity, because he said, you know, Steve, it's hard for me to compare uh, myself with everybody else. Everybody else is becoming doctors or engineers, or they're getting married, they're having families, and here I am, and I'm still trying to figure out what God's will is for my life. And I want to bring you to this verse in Romans, and it says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. A lot of times we believe that once we say the prayer of salvation, once we accept Jesus into our heart, then everything's going to be perfect. We're going to see rainbows and unicorns wherever we go. Can I give you the hard truth, the rated R truth, right? It's, it's not going to be all pleasantries in life. There are going to be storms. There are going to be hardships. But how you think yourself through those hardships are going to either help you or really harm you. And so here we have to understand the renewing of our mind is not a one-time process. It's a daily commitment every single morning. We have to make this conscious decision. This morning I am choosing to change the way I think. It's easy to go negative. It's easy to be a negative Nancy. It's easy to just say, oh, I'm a Debbie Downer. Oh, my goodness. Can, do you know that, um, you know, the, the UV rays from, from your uh, phone, it can give you um, skin cancer if you stare at it long enough. I'm like, who are you? Like, why, why, are, you, why are you trying to rain on my parade? And, 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 like, someone always finds the negative in something. And if you know of that person, if it happens to you your spouse, don't point at them right now. Okay, And so a lot of times we have to understand, are we thinking the way God thinks? Because to be a Christian is to be Christ-like, to be imitators of Christ. Therefore, if we are going to allow God to transform us, the first way of transformation is to change the way we think. So point one is think about what you think about. Think about what you think about. I heard a story about these two brothers um, a while back. They went to the hospital, and the doctor had some tragic news, and it was twin brothers. And to one of the brothers, they said, I'm so sorry, you have this crippling disease, and, you know, unfortunately, you won't be able to walk for the rest of your life. And then to the next twin... He said um, that that same disease is not found uh, with you. It's only with your brother. And so then the, per the twin that got the diagnosis of not being able to walk in a few more years, he was crippled with fear and he lived his life and he ended up being paralyzed or he ended up being in a wheelchair and just walk uh, went everywhere uh, handicapped. And then the twin that the doctor said there was nothing wrong. He ended up running a lot and ended up even going to the Olympics and winning a lot of medals. And then something peculiar happened. A couple of years later after he won this Olympic uh, medal, the, something had happened and they ended up getting a phone call from a hospital. They said, uh, we're sorry to inform you, but years ago we misdiagnosed you guys. In fact, we had swapped the results. So the one person that was supposed to have no diagnosis of anything, you're the, actually the one supposed to be paralyzed, but yet he won some medals. And the one that was, had no effect at all, but was diagnosed of a crippling disease, he thought himself into paralysis. Who do you think you are? The mind is a powerful thing. Philippians 4, verse 4 through 9 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate all that you do. Remember that the Lord is coming soon. So don't worry about anything. And instead, pray about everything. Let me ask you this question. Are you obeying the word of God? Do not worry about anything because 
because we want you to pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard our hearts and our minds. And as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Verse 9 is so cool. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything that you've heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Do you know who wrote this? Paul. Do you know where he was writing this? In a prison. And he's writing, rejoice in the Lord always. Just in case if you missed that. And again, I say rejoice. It's easy to rejoice when you're on the mountaintop. It's harder to rejoice when you're locked up in a prison. But I'm afraid if we can be honest this morning, a lot of, time, a lot of us are locked up in a mental prison. The enemy has locked us up and causing us to believe that we are a failure, we are mess ups, we are a mistake, we can never amount to anything. But God is wanting you to remember this morning, fix your thoughts on these things. Not just put them up there. I want to go a step further. Fix your thoughts. Literally, fix your thoughts. When you see yourself going in a negative mindset, you have to understand God has not called me to be under, but God has called me to be more than an overcomer. You have to encourage yourself daily, like David says. Encourage yourself daily in the Lord. But here's the craziest thing. A lot of times, many of us will say, well, all we have left to do is pray now. All we have, well, all, we did everything we could now. All we got to do is pray. All we have to do is pray? Come on. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Number two is fix your thoughts. But a sub point underneath that is Prayer is not a last resort. Prayer should be a first response. Prayer is not, hey, everything else went in a hell in a handbasket, so I guess all we got left now is to pray. No, our first response in everything is praying without ceasing. Praying, Lord, I don't know how you're going to get me out of this mess, but I know who's going to get me out of this mess. So, Lord, I thank you in advance for making a way where there seems to be no way. How many of us are praying these prayers? God, I pray that you would help my mind to think right. Fix your thoughts on whatever is lovely, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, pure, and admirable. If we could take your thoughts and put it on the screen, how many times do we think of things that are lovely, that are pure, that are holy? A lot of times when we look at others, we like to compare and criticize others. Are our thoughts of them lovely, pure, holy? Or are we always trying to one-up ourselves with everybody else in a mental competition? Well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Did you know that whether you lie or you commit murder, they're all the same in God's eyes? We're all sinners. We all need Jesus. So stop comparing yourself to everybody else, but instead fix your thoughts. And it's crazy because scientific research shows that prayer can literally rewire your brain. Dr. Caroline Leaf wrote a book called Switch on Your Brain, and in the book she writes, it has been found that 12 mi minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. And a lot of times we're struggling we're wondering, Lord, what's your will for my life? Fix your thoughts. Lord, I don't know what to do. Are you praying? Lord, help me. Okay, let's, let's have God help you. But how are you thinking? How are you praying? How are you interceding? These are the things that we have to think about. These are the things that we have to fix. In fact, I heard a pastor, Craig Rochelle, he said this. Worry 
is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. Worry. How many times have we been guilty of the sin of worry? Worrying that God won't come through. As if the whole Bible, which every promise that he said has come to pass, every prophecy that has been fulfilled, and yet all of a sudden in 2022, he's going to fail you now? We serve a God that was the same yesterday, is the same today, and forever will be the same. The same God that delivered Daniel from the pit of the lions is the same God that you serve. The same God that helped David defeat Goliath is the same God that you serve. The same God that took Joseph from the pit to the palace is the same God that you serve. So what makes you think that you are disqualified for having an answered prayer from the God Almighty that we serve? Stop worrying. I know it's easier said than done. It's so much easier to say, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about a thing. Now, let's, be, let's kind of put some caveats on this. This does not mean leave, uh, live a careless life and, hey, don't worry. Let me not put my seatbelt on. Let me just drive. The Lord has me, you know, under his wings. Okay, don't be an idiot, all right? You have, you have to understand that God has given us wisdom, number one. Number two, we have to look at what have we put ourselves in that bondage? Have we put ourselves in this place of entrapment? Don't be blaming the enemy for, lust of, for thoughts of lust when you yourself are open to browse around wherever you want to go. Don't blame the enemy for thoughts of anxiety when all that you watch on TV shows is just scripted reality drama crap. Can I say crap? Did the pastor she say crap? I'm oh, sorry. Rated R. <laughs> Rated R, exactly. <laughs> you have to understand that worry, if we don't take control of this, worry will soon eat up the little faith that we have. So faith is a muscle that needs to be exercised every single day. We have to fix and renew our mind daily so that way it gets larger and larger to overtake our worry. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, we demolish every pretentious every pretension that self that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ who's in control you or your thoughts Number three is fight to think right. Fight to think right. I'm going to take you to biology class for just a second. There's a mechanism in our brain that has a fight versus flight response. I'm sure you guys have heard of this. In fact, I want them to show a picture of the brain. You have two things here, one called the amygdala, another thing called the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is an almond-shaped part of the brain. In fact, it's known as the survival instinct of the brain. So immediately when you are in a place of danger, the amygdala is like, okay, you need to run for your life or you need to escape from this danger. So like when you hear something that you've never heard before while you're laying down in bed at night and you hear something, the amygdala will probably say, hey, it may be an intruder. But the prefrontal cortex is more of a logical place in our brain. And it may say, listen, it may be the dog that's in the crate that's just trying to get comfortable, relax. And so we have one that says flight, meaning 
hey, run as fast as you can. The worst is about to come. You better take, take run for cover. And the prefrontal cortex is, hey, relax. Let's try to think this through logically. Let's figure out what's going on. And we have to understand that there is a battle within our brain. One that's saying, take cover. One that's saying, take courage. What are you giving more authority to? You have to understand, we have to remind ourselves of the word of God, what God has promised us every single time. We serve a God that says, I will be with you. I will never forsake you. I will never abandon you. And yet, our flesh wants to say, you're alone. There's no one that loves you. There's no one that would see past your flaws. You're going to die alone. No one, you know, is going to be at your funeral, whatever the case may be. And we have to understand this tension that lies between fight, fight to think right. It is a fight to take captive every thought. If you're ever in a war zone, there's going to be a battle in order for you to take someone captive. They're going to put up a fight. It's going to take hard work for you to take someone into captivity. In fact, we're seeing this played out right now in, as far as war is concerned with Russia invading Ukraine. And you probably heard this on the news that the U.S. Um, told the president of Ukraine, hey, listen, we have a way for you to escape. We have safe houses. We'll take care of you. Um, here's the way, you know, just tell us what to do and we'll, we'll get you on a plane. We'll get you out of here. Do you know what the response of the president of Ukraine was? He said, we need more ammunition, not a ride out of here. His flight or fight response was, listen, I'm not going to leave my country when it needs me the most. And I saw pictures of him with a, a vest, like a camo vest on and bulletproof vest. I was like, man, this is a bad president. I wonder how many times... Have we taken this approach with the enemy? When the enemy is coming and attacking our mind and attacking us with fearful thoughts or with thoughts of worry, and the enemy wants us to take cover, the enemy wants us to run, but instead, do we have this uh, stance of authority just like the president of the Ukraine? I don't need to, to get out of here. I need to take a stand against what is wrong. I need to take a stand for what I believe. The Lord has given me a, a, a sense of fight in my spirit. I'm not going to run away from this battle. I'm going to run to the battle. I'm going to run in the battle. The enemy wants you to immediately panic and fear, but I want you to stand for, firm and remind yourself of who God says you are. There's a difference between fact and truth. The fact may be the doctor gave you a negative report. But the truth is we will believe the report of the Lord. The fact may be my bank account looks very low right now. But the truth is we serve a God who was Jehovah Jireh, who will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The fact may be, man, I am really weak in this area. But the truth is, in our weakness, he is made strong. How many of us are willing to say, despite what the facts may be, I'm going to take a stand on the truth of the word of God. I'm not going to let the world sway my opinions here and there. I'm not going to let current events dictate how I feel. I'm not going to let uh, the problems intimidate me. I'm not going to even tell God how big my problems are. Instead, I'm going to tell my problems how big my God is. This is the, 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 the message that I want you to receive this morning. Because I believe a lot of us Christ followers, us believers, if we are not careful, we are letting the enemy win. And in fact, I believe a lot of times we give too much credit to the enemy. Man, I, 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 
You can never seem to get a leg up in my finances. My bank account looks low. And yet your spending habits are thousands and thousands of dollars in debt on credit cards. That's not the enemy. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> that's, that's not the enemy. A lot of times we have to internalize and look and say, did I place myself in this position? Or am I allowing the enemy to have a foothold in my life? Whatever that looks like. I shared my testimony a couple of weeks ago when I was here, and obviously we have a fuller crowd this morning, so I feel prone to sharing this. You know, whenever my parents were expecting their first child to be born, they were excited, they went to the hospital, and um, the doctor came to my mom and said, I'm sorry, I have some horrible news to tell you. The umbilical cord has been wrapped around your baby's neck, and in fact, We've lost his heartbeat three times. He's flatlined three times in the womb. This is too complicated of a case. So we have to ask you, sir, who are you going to choose to survive? Either the life of your wife or the life of your baby because it's too complicated to save them both. In that moment of uncertainty, in that moment of fear and panic, how would you respond? Your spouse that you just started a life with a couple of years ago, and now this baby that's coming, and you're so excited to welcome it into the world. My, ba- my, my dad, being a man of faith, he stood, he stood his ground and he said, Doctor, I'm not walking out of this hospital without my entire family. God has promised me a family. And I'm going to stand on the promises of God. Immediately, my mom told the doctor, I feel like you need to go to the restroom. And the doctor said, that's not, you need to go to the restroom. This is an incredible opportunity, a window of opportunity. Let's quickly deliver the baby while we have this chance. People of God, can I tell you that I'm standing here before you as a testimony to let you know that God is on your side. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And at age one, my first birthday, exactly one year to the date of my birth, the apartment that we live in catches on fire. Everything that we have burns to the ground. I was supposed to be in the apartment, but miraculously, I was not. I'm still standing here before you to let you know that we serve a good God. At age seven, I fall into the deep end of a pool. I don't know how to swim. I end up going to the depths of the pool. One of the people that were with me, she realizes that I'm nowhere to be found, and so she goes to the deep end of the pool. She finds my body there, raises me back, and resuscitates me back to life. But I'm still standing here to let you know that we serve a good God. At age 14, I was supposed to go to a youth trip with my youth group to a camp. Being at age 14, I thought I had my whole life planned out. And so I was like, you know what? As a last minute decision, I'm not gonna go to youth camp. Instead, I'm gonna go take summer school to get my courses underneath my belt so I can graduate early and blah, 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 blah. I had paid my down payment to go to camp and this was a very last minute decision not to go. I'm talking about 24 hours before they left. Sunday morning like this, I remember being with my youth group and my pastor pulling me to the side and saying, hey, Steve, uh, I heard that you're not coming with us to the camp. What's going on? I said, hey, uh, I know that I paid to go to camp, but instead I want to go to summer school. And him being a typical youth pastor, he said, you could catch up on school later. Come on with us. It's okay to miss one week of school. I said, no, I'm sorry. You guys go ahead without me. That Monday morning, they end up leaving to go to Louisiana, towards Louisiana. And I end up going to summer school. Those times, those days, there was no text messaging on phones. There was something called 
AOL Instant Messenger. RIP. And um, someone sent me a, a chat and saying, Steve, um, did you hear about this bus wreck? In fact, I don't even think she was a believer. She just knew I went to church. So I guess she assumed that all churches were the same. And I was like, no, I didn't hear uh, what was going on. And she said, yeah, check out the news. There's something. And so I go to the ABC website, WFAA.com. And the headlines read, four teenagers and bus driver die on a way to a youth camp. And then I read the name of the church and my heart sunk and I literally felt like the whole world just stopped for a quick second because that was a church that I attended. In fact, I remember those four teenagers 24 hours before on a Sunday morning like this. In fact, one of them was named Michael. Me and Michael, we had a great friendship and he was an avid video game player. I, at the time, was the same as well. And we had made plans to have a uh, Mario Kart tournament on Super Nintendo. Praise the Lord. And so I told Michael, hey, Michael, I, I know you're going to youth camp. And listen, when you get back, I'm going to whoop your butt on Mario Kart. He said, okay, we'll see about that, Steve. He was 12. I was 14 at the time. And the next day, the bus driver was driving the bus. He didn't sleep for the past 36 hours. Fell asleep while driving and crashed into a pillar underneath the bridge. Two of my friends, Amanda and Michelle, they were ejected out of the windshield at over 90 miles an hour, hitting the, the highway concrete, instantly dying. Two of my other friends, including Michael, were crushed in between the seats because of the severity of the impact against the pillar. 40 of my friends were care flighted to seven different hospitals in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In fact, the crash was right in Terrell, Texas, which is not that far from us. They were on their way to go to Louisiana, and yet they were less than an hour out from the church. And I remember standing there in the memorial service that night. All the camera crews from around the country were there, ABC, CNN, AB, uh, uh, CNBC, you name it, they were all there covering this tragic news story. And I remember sitting in my seat during the memorial service, and I was so angry at God. I was so frustrated. Say, God, I was supposed to be on that bus 24 hours ago. I was supposed to be on that bus. I was, was supposed to be on that bus and, and made that decision not to go 24 hours, 24 hours ago. God, why, why am I here? I felt, if you look at medical terminology, it's called survivor's guilt. Why did I survive and yet they die? And the Lord reminded me, Steve, this is not the first or the second time that I've spared your life. The reason why you're here is because I'm still writing out your story. People of God, I want to encourage you. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. I know Alex said about thoughts of suicide. He was praying against that. And I, and I felt that overwhelmingly too this morning that someone here may be fighting against thoughts of suicide. Can I encourage you? The enemy is a liar. Do not allow the enemy to win that battle. There is a God who loves you, a God that cares about you. You have people who love you. You have people that care about you. And I also felt as I was preparing this message, I felt like there's been someone that's been wrestling through thoughts of anxiety and just they can't go to sleep well at night because of these thoughts that are consistently going through their minds. In fact, the enemy is robbing you of peace at night. 
I want to encourage you to cast your cares at the feet of Jesus. And so after the bus wreck happened, I remember, I remember getting PTSD because about three weeks after the bus crash happened, there was a major camp in um, Atlanta that said, listen, we understand that your youth group had this tragic accident. They weren't even able to go. Hey, let's just take the kids that are able to, let's just get them away from everything that's happening at home. Let them just escape for a week and come to our camp for free. You don't have to worry about anything. He provided police escorts. He provided, he's like, I will double vet everything. I'll make sure that everybody's okay. And I remember going on the bus to go to Atlanta. And I remember my heart beating at a million miles an hour, like out of my chest. And the thoughts of fear, the thoughts of anxiety, the enemy playing mind games with me saying, Steve, do you you remember what happened to your friends the last time they got on the bus? That was triggering for me. I don't know about you. I don't know what thoughts are triggering you. Maybe it's that person that hurts you. And the thought of that person or even mentioning their names, it brings triggering thoughts to you. Or maybe that situation in your life, you you just try to push it to the side. Like Alex said, you just try to brush it off. Can I encourage you? The The enemy wants you to stay defeated, but the Lord wants you to experience peace and freedom this morning if you allow him to. I believe that in God's sovereignty, in his providence, in his divine orchestrated plan, he planned that, you know what? Out of every Sunday in the entire year, I'm going to allow Pastor Sonia to experience contractions at this time on a Sunday morning so that they would have to go to the hospital and I'm going to allow Steve to speak on the stage. It's not about me. Listen, listen, I believe that the enemy wants you to believe, hey, this is just a coincidence. But God is saying, it's not a coincidence. This is a divine appointment to meet you where you are at this morning. It is not by coincidence that you are here in this place this morning. Whether you are dealing with thoughts right now that the enemy has been playing mind games with you, or number two, maybe there is a season that's coming soon that you're going to have to refer to these notes. Because listen, we all experience Highs and lows. If you're at a valley, wait for next season. You may, be at a va- you may be at a mountaintop. If you're at a mountaintop, wait for next season. You may be at a valley. But through every season, through every high and low, one thing that I know is we serve a God who never changes. He is the same. He is consistent. And he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all they could ever ask or imagine. And then as the years went on, I ended up getting married and we were trying our hardest to get pregnant. And after three years, we were like, okay, let's go see a specialist. We ended up seeing a specialist. She ended up being the number one fertility specialist in the nation. She's located here in Dallas. And <clears throat> she kind of brushed it off when we said, hey, we've been trying. And then when we told her, no, we've been trying for three years, that caught her attention. And she said, okay, let's take some tests. Let's see what's going on. They ran every test on me and Blessy. Came back. Everything was normal. There was nothing wrong with us. And she just said, I don't have an answer for you guys. It just takes some time. And I was like, easy for you to say. <laughs> and so I said, what's, what's your suggestion? And she said, well, we can try this treatment. It's uh, a treatment before you get to the IVF stage. And here's what we do, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, let's try it. It's a very expensive treatment. Insurance doesn't cover it. And um, we ended up paying $5,000 for this treatment. And bless you, I had to get several shots. And it was, we were so excited and anticipating for some good news. And then it happened where the treatment failed. Like I said last time, I remember where I was holding bless you in my arms and her 
being devastated. I was devastated. My faith was really weary at that point. But let me just be honest with you. It's easy to preach, have faith when everything's going good. But when you're in the valley and you've tried everything in your own power, it's hard to have faith. And we got to a place where I talked to Blessing. I was like, listen, we've been trying this on our own effort because the doctor said, hey, let's just try this treatment three more times. So I was like, Psh, yeah, right. I don't have $15,000 just lying around the bank. And so then I said, Blessy, let's give it to God. We've been trying in our own efforts, and this doesn't happen. But let's cast our cares. Let's submit this at the feet of Jesus. As soon as we did, two months later, we get pregnant. And so here we are. We're excited. She's pregnant. And like, I'm, I'm doing everything in my own power to make sure that this pregnancy goes well. Like anything short of wrapping her in bubble wrap, I was able to do, right? I was like, okay, do you need to sit down? Do you want me to get you some water? Are you craving onion rings? I mean, I, I'll get you whatever you need. And it was crazy because within a four-month period, she gets in three accidents that were not her fault. Three accidents in four months. And the worst accident was whenever I happened to be in India about to preach, and I get a text message of a picture of my wife's car being T-boned by a car that went 50 miles an hour, and she was crossing a green light. Someone ran a red light and hit her. All while she's pregnant. And I remember, let's get rated R here. I'm not going to cuss, just relax. <laughs> I remember getting frustrated. God, God, this is the miracle that you promised me, right? This is the miracle that we've been believing for, right? Why is everything going haywire right now? We've been doing all the right things. God, seriously. But yet, Two teenagers, they look at each other and they get pregnant. <laughs> Here we are doing all the right things, and yet everything is attack after attack after attack after attack. And one thing that I, that I felt the Lord tell me is, Steve, don't you understand? The attacks didn't prosper. The weapons may have hurt, but they didn't prosper. They didn't succeed. They didn't win. Can I encourage you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yes, it may hurt for a season. It may hurt for a night. But can I encourage you that although you're going through some sorrow in the night, joy comes in the morning. Morning is not just a.m. Morning is when you wake up to the sense knowing that God has still brought you to see another day. That morning is when you realize, God, you are a faithful God. Despite how many mistakes that I've made, despite how many failures I've done, despite how many things that I've messed up on my own effort, God, you still chose to love a sinner like me and send your only son to die a brutal, bloody death for me. This is when we wake up to the authority that God has given us. So can I encourage you, people of God, it is time to send an eviction notice to the enemy and letting him know he is no longer allowed in your mind. He is no longer allowed to whisper in your ears. In fact, I want to encourage you to be still and know that he is God. You can do everything in your efforts and have it fail. But the last, the last thing I want to encourage you with is stay, stay in it. Keep your feet planted because you have a God who, has, who is fighting on your behalf. You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. He's already defeated the grave. He's already defeated death. There is no battle that our God has ever lost. So why do you think he's going to lose your battle? He's in control. He has everything in the palm of his hands. I want to encourage you this morning. Who do you think you are? I want to remind you who you, who you are. You are chosen. John 15, 16. 
You are loved. Jeremiah 31.3. You are strong. Isaiah 40.31. You are not alone. Matthew 28.20. You are protected. Psalms 121, verse 3. You are a child of God. Romans 8, 17. You are a child of God. Because I have a three-year-old now, because I have a son, if he goes through anything, you better believe I'm going to protect him and fight on his behalf. I'm going to do everything in my power to protect him. Don't you think our Heavenly Father has more of a care for us than we do for our earthly children? He wants to protect you. He wants to cover you with his love. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I felt like, as I was preparing, like I said earlier, that there's someone, maybe a couple of people, that are struggling with anxious thoughts that's keeping you up at night. Maybe if we can take an inventory, we're allowing the whispers of the enemy to be louder than the voice of truth in our lives. If we can be honest again, Maybe we have a hard time transforming our mind, transforming the way we think on a daily basis. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your promise of victory over our lives, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that there is nothing impossible with you there is nothing that you cannot do. There is no mountain that you cannot move. There is no giant that you can't conquer. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us as your children, as the people of God, who we are in you, Jesus. Lord, we will worship as if you've already provided our miracle. We will worship you as if we will praise you before the miracle even happens, God. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are for us. You are not against us. Lord, we thank you that you go before us. You go in front of us. And, Lord, all you ask us to do is to trust in you, for you have overcome the world. The battle is yours, but the victory belongs to us. We thank you, Jesus. Church, if you stand up for a quick second, we're going to go into a time of worship, but I really feel the need to pray for some of you. Please listen. Like I said earlier, I really believe that God orchestrated everything to happen the way it was supposed to this morning. Some of you need to be reminded that you have a place at the Father's Son that hasn't been sleeping well at night because your mind is literally going at a million miles an hour. I want you to be encouraged to know that God already has the solution for the situation that you're stressed out about. So just trust in him. Know that he has everything worked out for your good. And number three, if you are a person who is weary, you feel like you're on your last thread of hope, I want to pray for you. Do not let your pride keep you in your seats. That's what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy wants you to keep quiet, sit in your seat, don't, don't come up to the front or else all these people are going to think this, that, and the other. You've had the enemy lie to you long enough. Tell him to shut up this morning. It's time for you to have victory this morning. Aren't you tired of living life the way you've done it this whole time and living in defeat? Do something different. Do something drastic. And let's start living in a place of victory and freedom. So as we go into worship, for those that need prayer, I, I really invite you, I plead with you, don't let the enemy lie to you and keep you in your seats. It's okay to step out of your comfort zone. Listen, we, we have a God whose son stepped out of his comfort, died a brutal, he got uncomfortable for us. 
So let's get uncomfortable for him. If you're ashamed of him before men, he will be ashamed of you in heaven. So please, don't let the enemy win. Come forward, let's pray, and let's see your season of victory come to be in Jesus' name.